Hello, Walden Church. Thank you for joining us this morning. Uh, I got a question for you. Can anyone tell me who this is? I'll give you a hint. She was the first CEO of the Mattel company from 1945 to 1975. This is Ruth Handler, and her name might not immediately ring a bell, but her invention, the Barbie doll, I'm sure everybody knows. Back in 1938, she married her high school sweetheart, Elliot Handler, and they moved to Los Angeles to start a furniture business. And they decided to make their furniture out of two types of plastic, lucite and plexiglass. Ruth worked in sales. She was even able to get contracts with Douglas Aircraft Company. And later, the two of them went into a partnership with a man named Harold Matson, and they combined Matson's last name with Elliot's first name, and they got Mattel. But during World War II, furniture sales fell, so Mattel began to manufacture toy dollhouse furniture. The success of this business caused Ruth and Elliot to fully move Mattel into a toy manufacturing company. In 1959, Ruth noticed that her daughter had way more interest in playing with paper dolls that looked like full-grown adults than she did other dolls that looked like little babies. So she designed a plastic doll that had grown-up features and brought it to the 1959 New York Toy Fair. And then the Barbie doll was an instant hit with young girls. Mattel's business expanded, and Ruth's Barbie doll invention to this day, uh, has helped Mattel become one of the largest toy manufacturers in the world. Who had a Barbie doll as a kid? Did you have a Barbie doll as a kid? Uh, let me ask you a couple questions, all right? Let's see, if you, let's see if you know some Barbie history or some Barbie facts. How tall is Barbie? No, not, not 12 inches, not the doll, like in real life. Like if she were a real life person, how tall do you think she would be? Six feet tall, she's six feet tall. Average height of an American woman is about five foot four. That's a lot to live up to. So that's just how tall she is, but do you know uh, her measurements? If she were a real person, what her measurements would be? 32, 22, 29. So a 22 inch waist, yeah. So just as a doll in a box, with no possessions, no job, <laughs> she's already a success, right? Because she has the ideal hourglass figure. But what does she do for a living? What does Barbie do for a living, do we know? She's been a lot of things, right? She's been an actor, an artist, a ballerina, a chef, a circus performer, a dancer, a fashion designer, a floral designer, a game show host, a musician, uh, a news anchor, a photographer, a singer. We all remember that she was the first woman in space, right? Yeah, that's right. There was an astronaut Barbie for sale long before the first woman ever went into space. And she's also a doctor. Mattel says Barbie has had over 200 careers. So she's attractive and successful. Over the past 60 years, Barbie's dream house has transformed from a simple fold-out studio with cardboard furniture to a three-story mansion with a pool, an elevator, and light and sounds. There's been over 20 different models of the Barbie dream house. She's traveled to 150 countries. Andy Warhol painted her. Not to mention the countless vehicles she's had, hundreds of friends, thousands of clothes. Suffice it to say, Barbie is crushing it, right? She's doing great with no signs of stopping. She is living the American dream and she's an inspiration to little girls everywhere. Barbie performs. She is successful. But do you know what Barbie doesn't do? Barbie doesn't check her social media and spy on her friends from high school or college and she doesn't stress about how they are doing better than she is. She is not checking out her neighbor's lawn or her neighbor's boat because nobody is doing better than she is. 
None of her friends make more money. None of her friends have a better house. None of her friends have a cuter boyfriend. She is the apex predator. Instead, it's the rest of the world, right? Who is comparing itself to her or in reality, as we grow up, we compare ourselves to who has a bigger house, who makes more money, who has a better job, who got a better promotion, who has gone into business for themselves, who has a better portfolio, who is thinner, younger, smarter, who has a more beautiful vintage car, who has more than two cars, who has more boats, who has taken more vacations, who can run faster, jump higher, who has a better golf swing, who has a better backhand, who can swim more laps, who can score more goals, who can score higher on the test, who has more diplomas, who has discovered more, developed more, produced more. Who do you know that's crushing it, killing it, destroying the competition? Americans, we love to work and we love to compete and we are all encouraged to do our very best. What about churches? Yeah, even churches. I mean, if you're talking to somebody and uh, the subject of church comes up, we use words like mega church. What's your church like? Oh, we're a church of about 200. Well, that's not really what your church is like. That's how big your church is. We have an amazing youth ministry. We have a wonderful worship band. We have a dynamic teacher. What does all that mean? Our church is crushing it, right? We're a success. We are doing well. We're, we own our own building. We own our own property. We have no debt. We're raising money for Africa. We're raising money for water. We're helping kids go to college. That's our resume. That's how we look on paper. But does that resume then go with us into heaven? Do we get to take it with us when we uh, are met at the pearly gates? Do we have to list all of our successes in order to get in? Because I've heard there is a book, right? I've heard there's a book in heaven, right? You've heard this too, some, some magical book. Revelation 20 says, Then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. From his presence, earth and sky fled away and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the book, according to what they had done. Gah! What? According to what they have done? What have I done? How, how, how many books of the Bible have I read? How many verses have I memorized? How, how many people? Have I converted to Christianity? How many ministry hours have I put in? How many dollars have I given the church? Jesus, am I a success? Am I crushing it for your kingdom? Is that a concern of yours? That you're not doing enough for God? I mean, maybe you're doing better than the Smith family next door. Maybe you're doing better than your brother-in-law. But are you doing better in the spiritual world? I want to read you a story from the Gospels that perhaps we don't give too much thought to. It's a story about the disciples being sent out into the world to do ministry. It comes from Luke chapter 10. It says, After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them on ahead of him two by two into every town and place where he himself was about to go. And he said to them, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the harvest. Go your way. Behold, I am sending you out as lambs in the midst of wolves. Carry no money bag, no knapsack, no sandals, and greet no one on the road. Whatever house you enter, first say, Peace be to this house. And if a son of peace is there, your peace will rest upon him. But if not, it will return to you. And remain in the same house, eating and drinking what they provide, for the laborer deserves his wages. Do not go from house to house. Whenever you enter a town and they receive you, eat what is set before you. Heal the sick in it and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. But whenever you enter a town and they do not receive you, go into its streets and say, even the dust of your town that clings to our feet, we wipe off against you. Nevertheless, know this, that the kingdom of God has come near. I tell you, it will be more bearable in the day for Sodom than for that town. 
The 72 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and all the power of the enemy and nothing shall hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. You know this story? You familiar with it? Because because I have a question for you about this story. Who were the 72? Who were they? I mean, can you name any of them? Of course not. The story is only listed here in Luke. Some translations say 70, others say 72, but they are not named. Were they short, tall, men, women, rich, poor? We know nothing about them. All we know is they are not the 12. It doesn't say the 12 plus 60 others. So this is the B team, right? Can you name the disciples? Sure. There's Peter, Andrew, John, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, Simon, Big James, Little James, Judas, and Judas. But here we have 72 unknown disciples, 72 lesser knowns. These are the people who I'm sure would have probably loved to be in Jesus' inner circle, but they're kind of stuck in the middle. You know what that's like? I mean, they're not the masses. They're not the crowds. These people are, you know, those people are nameless. They're faceless. But they're also not the elite. They're not the cool kids. Instead, the 72 are stuck somewhere in the middle between total obscurity and the cool clique. They're not totally on the inside but not totally on the outside. Barbie had Skipper. Jesus has the 72. So I'm sure these are people who probably wanted more, perhaps wanted to prove themselves, wanted Jesus to notice them. And so here in Luke 10, Jesus gives them their first assignment, right? Yes, a mission, an opportunity for Jesus to notice them. And did you see? They were told not just to evangelize, Jesus gives them his authority, his power. So this is exciting. Jesus says they can heal, they can cast out demons. This is going to be awesome, right? I'm going to do so much for the kingdom. I'm going to heal everybody. Uh, Listen, even if you've got a sprain or or tonsils or tennis elbow or the common cold, I'm going to cast, I'm going to cast out every demon. I'm going to crush it for Jesus. And Jesus sends them out two by two, into the real world, to be the hands and feet of the kingdom, to be the church. And they're so excited. And by the sound of it, they were a huge hit. They were successful. The 72 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. That's all we needed to hear. They returned with joy. So they must have felt accomplished. They must have felt successful. Surely Jesus will notice us now and we'll get our names in the Bible. They run back to Jesus proud. Even the demons are subject to us. They've done everything Jesus asked. And Jesus rebukes them. What? What's going on? Didn't they do what Jesus wanted them to do? They understood the assignment. But Jesus says, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. What does that mean? It means they understood the assignment, but their joy was misplaced. Jesus says, oh, you saw, you saw demons tremble? That's nothing. I saw Satan fall from the sky, but it's not about that. Jesus told them right before they left, The harvest is plentiful, the laborers are few. Jesus sent them out into the harvest to serve, to love, to bring the peace of God. But it seems the 72 were more excited that they were able to do miracles. They came back with this long list of accomplishments. Jesus sent them out and they crushed it for Jesus. And Jesus said, whoa, 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 whoa. It's not about the number of demons that you cast out. It's about the lives that you touched. It's it's about the people you serve. It's about the harvest. 
And I think as a church that exists in this corporation, do more, succeed more, competitive world that we live in, we will get swept up in all of this same excitement as well. The 72 had missed the point of ministry. Jesus gives his mission statement in Luke 19. He says, the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Did Jesus cast out demons? Yes. Did he heal people? Yes, of course. But that wasn't why he came. Jesus wanted to heal. He wanted to relieve suffering. But he came to bring peace. He came to bring wholeness. And yes, a part of that was to heal. But it wasn't the point. Jesus once told a parable of a lost sheep. He said, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so, I tell you, there'll be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. Jesus is the loving shepherd who goes out of his way to leave the crowd, leave popularity in order to go after one obscure person who was out on the fringe to bring outsiders back inside. Jesus wanted to save lost lambs. He was interested in a full ripe harvest and that included everyone. In Matthew 16, the Pharisees and Sadducees came to test Jesus and they asked him, show them a sign from heaven. Hey Jesus, we heard you did miracles. Can you show us a magic trick? <laughs> show us your power. Do you think that went over well? It didn't. Because it wasn't about power. The point of ministry is not about how much authority you have. It's about seeing people transformed. It's about the rescue. So Jesus doesn't want kingdom ministry with worldly motives. Sadly, as the 72 learned, we can bear kingdom fruit without kingdom love. The 72 didn't run back with the names of the relationships that they formed or the lost who had been found. They were using the world's playbook. They were using the world's spreadsheet of pluses and minuses and dollars and cents. And it's not their fault. We can't blame them. This is how we are raised. This is the world that we live in. We live in a Barbie world of performance, lifestyle, looks, portfolio. And we feel this pressure from the outside world all the time. Everything we do is aggressive. Everything we do is competitive. I mean, look how we talk about successful people. Do we say it calmly? Do we say, well, good for them, <laughs> right? I'm, they're doing well. I'm sure they're happy. No, we say, he's crushing it. He's killing it. He's destroying it. Hey, did you guys win that game? Win? Ha! We killed them. We destroyed them. We annihilated them. And it's not just sports. It's not just business. We might not say it out loud, but it creeps into all aspects of our life. Is your family crushing it? Is your church destroying all the other churches around it? Can you imagine if the body of Christ ran back to Jesus with the same response as the 72? Jesus, look how tall our steeple is. Look how much money we, we raised for camp. Look how beautiful our choir is, how they sing. Look at our church staff. We've got 15 pastors on staff. We passed out 100 Bibles this last Easter. We had over 300 people in service for Christmas Eve. Is that what Jesus wants to hear? What about the harvest? What about the lost sheep? I really doubt Jesus wants us to crush anything or anyone. The number of demons we cast out, what is that? It's a number. Jesus' kingdom advances through love. Our mission is love. Tell me something. 
Why did you cast out that demon? Was it because you loved that person? Was it because you wanted that person to be healed? You wanted them to be relieved of that burden? Or were they just a number to you? As a church, we cannot get so caught up in numbers that we forget names. Jesus, we're the largest church in the state. Jesus says, don't rejoice in that. You know, this competitive, do more competition world that we live in, it's not healthy. There is so much brokenness and heartache that exists. Researchers have found that the number of competitions that every single individual participates in now has greatly increased over the past years. And social media pressure adds to those feelings and they give people a sense of incompetence because it always shows somebody with a bigger house or a better job or a more beautiful family. Schools and workplaces also cultivate this competitive nature and we take it to the extreme. Unhealthy competition contributes to very real, very negative mental effects. Stress, jealousy, anxiety. Those are all natural effects of excessive and unhealthy competitiveness. Overachievers are always favored. And those who cannot accomplish the same feel inadequate. Yes, Barbie can inspire young girls, but she can also hurt. And all of our sports heroes and celebrity icons and business heroes can too. Because if I fail at measuring up to the ideal that's being shown on TV, I may begin to experience feelings of inferiority and dissatisfaction with my life. It's ironic that we all want to be winners, right? And that we want to align ourselves with winning people and winning brands. But when religious people saw Jesus, what did they accuse him of? Mark 2 says, as Jesus reclined at the table, many tax collectors and sinners were reclining with Jesus and his disciples. For there were many who followed him. And the scribes of the Pharisees saw that he was eating with sinners and tax collectors, they said to his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? Jesus didn't hang out with the winners. He hung out with the losers. Romans says, do not conform to the pattern of this world. If we are spinning our wheels, trying desperately to sit at the winner's table, I think we need to look around first and ask ourselves, is that where Jesus is sitting? But back to our story in Luke. Jesus doesn't just rebuke the 72. He says, don't rejoice in your works. Instead, he says, nevertheless, do not rejoice in this. The spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Does anybody remember paper phone books? Remember the big paper phone? It was like the internet got printed out on paper. And you always got them at your doorstep. And the first thing you did was you went through it and tried to find your name, right? Oh, there I am, I'm in the phone book, right? Is that what Jesus means? That your name is written, that your name is in the phone book in heaven? What does that mean, written in heaven? Or, or um, sometimes you might see the, the phrase, the book of life, like we read in Revelation, right? The book of life. Have you heard that phrase? What is this mysterious book? The book of life is not a phone book of names. It's probably more like a photo album of a family. And the Bible talks about it like it's a will. It's, it's, a, it's a place where you receive your inheritance. But it's also like a marriage document. It says these people are in a relationship. It's also kind of used like a peace treaty. Like this, this is the official document that says there is now peace between these two parties. And it's also where citizenship is recorded, where, where, where you say, I belong to this family. I belong to this kingdom. The book of life is a book of your family history. It's the book that says you belong. And I believe that our joy, our true, unescapable, unending joy 
to serve and love the world comes from knowing, just knowing, just knowing that our names are written there. Each person in this room, each person watching from home has four human longings that go deeper than money, deeper than success. We want to be chosen. We want to belong. We want internal peace. And they want a lasting inheritance. Good news. The book of life says you are chosen. Jesus says in John 14, I go and prepare a place for you. I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am you may be also. John says in Revelation, I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. You are that chosen. You are that bride. Jesus tells his disciples, you did not choose me, I chose you. Why did Jesus choose Peter, right? Why did Jesus choose the sons of thunder? Why did Jesus choose Judas? Because they were crushing it in the world? No, because they were, had really impressive resumes? No, he chose you, he chose me for the same reason he loves us. Titus 3, 5 says, not because of righteous things we have done, but because of his mercy. The book of life says you belong. Philippians 3 says, our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. The truth is, as a follower of Jesus, you already belong. With, with all the rights and all the privileges that come with it, when Jesus saves the lost lamb, that was you, and he brought you from the outside in. You are in. Romans 12 says, so we though many are one body in Christ and individually members one of another. Meaning you not only belong to Christ, you also belong to each other. And if you are sitting here this morning, if you are watching from home, you can stop searching for a place to belong. You belong here. The book of life says you have peace. We all want peace. We all hate conflict. But the good news is you don't have to live your life worrying that God is angry with you or that you need to do something to make him happy again. We don't have to fret or wonder, is God angry? Is God disappointed in me? What if I sin? If I sin, did I make it worse? Do I need to start over again? Colossians 1 says, through Jesus, to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. The cross made peace for every single one of us. God is not at war with us. And we are not toiling with our nose to the grindstone, trying to earn his attention or his favor. We are not per performing or even outperforming the person next to us. In fact, Jesus said very famously, come to me all who labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. What is that? The CEO, the leader of a movement who asks us to rest invites us to rest, says you can relax, you can de-stress, that's really good news. And lastly, the book of life says we have a lasting inheritance. Galatians says, for in Christ Jesus you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have been put on Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to promise. This passage says, you, your name is written into the family of God. You are a co-heir with Jesus. Paul writes in Ephesians, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in Christ with what? Every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. We have every spiritual blessing. The Greek word there for, for blessing is the same word that an economist would use 
to talk about the wealthiest people in all the world, which means that God's kingdom, within God's kingdom, there is no, there is no middle. There is no middle class. We are all in the in crowd. We are all the spiritually elite. We all have the riches of Christ. And Jesus tells the 72 and us when we realize these things, that you are all these things. You are chosen, you belong, you have peace, you have a lasting inheritance. Everything is yours. You have nothing to prove. Your name is written forever in the book of life. If you understand that, you should have real joy. That is where your real joy, your real rejoicing comes from. Jesus says, hey, 72, don't rejoice in the theatrics. Don't rejoice in the fact that you crushed it today. Don't rejoice that you have more plastic cars and more plastic mansions. Rejoice that your name is written in the book of life. I want you to consider one more thing and then we'll, then we'll wrap up. There are two accounts of Jesus' accomplishments. Not the four Gospels. I'm not talking about that. There are two accounts of what he did. The first account says, Jesus was born of a virgin. Anybody else? Anyone, anyone done that before? That's a very small, very elite group, right? As a child, he was already teaching people in the synagogue. He was even teaching their leaders. Pretty smart. At 30, he goes into business for himself, and it was a wonderful movement. It was a movement of social justice, but then it was also a movement of inclusivity, brought in people from all walks of life. He had unlimited power. He could control disease. He could control the elements. He could even control demonic forces. Crowds followed him. Thousands of people loved him, and his popularity grew and grew until he uh, received national attention from Rome. And even as he stood at his trial, when you'd think anybody else would be worried, Jesus is cool and calm and collected, and he talks about, you know, philosophy. You know, what is truth? <laughs> right? And then he dies. But not so fast. He resurrects. He makes the ultimate comeback. And for his finale, he ascends into heaven. He sits at the right hand of God to thunderous applause. That was Jesus' life. Is that the gospel? Is that the good news? Well, consider the second list of accomplishments. Jesus begins his life by living in obscurity for 30 years. We have one or two stories about his childhood, but in truth we know very little, until he's 30 years old. And then the curtains part, he steps out on stage, he wades into the water to be baptized by his cousin, and a hush falls, and people listen, and they hear a voice, one lone voice, from heaven that says, this is my son whom I love, with him I am well pleased. But Jesus hasn't done anything yet. Yes, he has. Jesus has lived a life of love and obedience. That's what God wants most. Not what we can do for him, but just to enjoy him and to love him and to love his creation. And because Jesus knew that he was loved, because Jesus knew that he was from love, that freed him to love others without restraint, without having to worry about what other people thought or said or did. The knowledge that he was loved and accepted by his father. That's the only confidence that he needed to be bold and to be brave and to speak the truth. Yes, he did miracles, but the point wasn't miracles. He wasn't loved by his followers for miracles. He was loved because he valued people over power. 
Jesus was free to love and free to serve because he knew before he had even done a single thing, done a single miracle, cast out a single demon, that his heavenly father already loved him, already accepted him. Don't rejoice that the demons are subject to you. Rejoice that you are chosen. Rejoice that you belong. Rejoice that you have peace. Rejoice that you have an everlasting inheritance. You are already a success. You are already complete in him. Let's pray. Lord, each one of us stands before the mirror and we are trained to see what the world tells us. That if we're tall or thin or young or old, if we're smart, successful, attractive, we are judged and weighed and measured by the world around us. And we get caught up in this and we try to be successful in the world. May yours be the only voice we listen to. May each one here hear your own voice. This is my son. This is my daughter whom I love. And with them I am well pleased. That you chose us before we ever did any good thing. You forgave us before we ever confessed. You gave your life before we were ever born. And there's nothing we could do to make you love us more. Free us from trying to earn the world's acceptance. Free us from trying to earn our salvation. Give us the same freedom to love the world with abandon, simply armed with the knowledge that our names are written in the book of life. Give us this same joy every day. Amen. Hey, thanks for coming out and worshiping with us. Thanks for uh, tuning in and watching this channel. If you would like, you can always, you know, clip and copy the link up there and post it to your own Facebook wall or social media. Let other people know what you watch on Sunday mornings. Of course, you're always invited here to church. We would love to have you. We have a 9.30 service, which is our traditional service. It has a choir, we sing responsive uh, readings, we say the Lord's Prayer, we have communion. It's gonna be like the church that you grew up in. And then we have a service at 11 o'clock. It's led by a worship band. And we have a full children's program from birth all the way through high school. We wanna be the church where you live. I'll see you guys next week. Bye.